I think we can uh, we can start. So um, good afternoon to everybody and welcome uh, to Walter. So our this is the fourth uh, um, lecture of our South Caucasus Archaeologist Series 2023 of the Harvard Archaeology in Action series of lectures. So our guest is Walter Kuntner, who will talk also on behalf of Sandra Heinz, his co-director. And both of them are working at the Institute for Alt für Alte Geschichte und Alte Orientalistik at the University of Innsbruck. So their field of research is the archaeology of the Near East uh, with a special focus on the first millennium BC in South, uh, in, uh, um, so, uh, especially on the, in the Southern Caucasus, in particular the Urartian and post-Urartian Achaemenian periods. So in the last 15 years, they've been carrying out uh, field projects in Armenia at Aramus, at Karmir Blur more recently, in Georgia at Kovregora in the Shidakarli region, as well as in, as in Iran. Uh, previously, they were also active in southern Mesopotamia at uh, Borsipa. So their projects have a special interest in landscape archaeology and also in the application of digital archaeological uh, um, technologies in uh, the digital technologies in the documentation of uh, of uh, archaeological sites. And also another interest, interest is absolute and relative chronology. Uh, uh, they have been editing recently the, the, the volume Befund und Historisierung, Dokumentation und ihre Interpretation Spielräume um, of their, in their access series. And this was exactly about archaeological periodization schemes of material culture development in Northern Mesopotamia and Southern Caucasus from the 7th to the 5th centuries BC. So today, the, uh, Walter will present us uh, the lecture about the Urartian presence in Armenia and its cultural legacy. So Walter, uh, the, the floor is yours, so you can, you can start your presentation. So, thank you very much and good evening to everybody. So, of course, we would like to start our lecture in, uh, by thanking the organizers. There is uh, some... <laughs> Please switch on, uh, switch yeah, off the microphones. Yeah, we have microphones. To, uh, somebody has to switch off the microphones, please. <laughs> so thank you very much. So thanks for the organizers and of course, in particular to our dear colleague, Elena Rova for inviting us to this series of uh, online lectures on archeology span of the South Caucasus. And in particular, also for the opportunity to discuss some ideas. And I, I want to stress it. What we are going to, to discuss today are basically ideas. So maybe not completely finished the, in, in the concept, but as I think nevertheless interesting, which are based on our ongoing archeological excavations in Armenia, as already Elena told us in Aramus, most recently in Kamir Blur, and of course also in Hovlegora which uh, might appear uh, to completely different regions, but it seems that to understand Urartu, we have also to include the archeology span of Georgia as the relationships in particular in the first millennium BC are becoming more and more uh, clear. And I think this is a, a new approach New, it's not really new because Piotrowski already started to think in this way, but uh, in, in let's see in the Western, traditions of archaeological research. So in this context, I would like also to point out that these excavations are carried out as part of an international field school program, open to all interested students all around the world of archaeology, which are conducted in cooperation with the Yerevan State University, the Tbilisi State University, the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography at the National Academy of Sciences in Armenia, and finally, the Erebuni Historical and Archaeological Museum Reserve 
So we would like to take this opportunity also to thank our Armenian and Georgian partners. This is Heike Vitisian, Vachtan Glicheli, Arsen Bobokian, and Mikhail Badalian for their great support in all these years. Few words should finally also be spent on the catchwords in our title in order to give a short introduction of the issues we will focus on in this lecture. These are, as you can see, the Russian presence and the cultural legacy in Armenia. Two concepts whose interdependency has become one of the most debated issues in Russian studies, not only because of our excavations in Alamus or in Kamio Blue, but I think more generally, as uh, while speaking with many colleagues working in, uh, in Armenia, uh, I, I feel that they are faced with similar problems of, in, and to be more precise, problems of incompatibility between the archaeological results and the interpretation in the frame of the current historical reconstruction of Russian history. In this regard, I would like to mention in particular the Armenian Polish expedition in Medzamo under the direction of Pili Posian and Jakubiak, which have raised serious doubts about the existence of a burnt destruction layer Get, that could be correlated with the Orachan conquest of the Ararat plain around 790. The new evidence seems rather to point to a less violent takeover of this site and to a more gradual development, as in particular in the pottery, as has recently been discussed by Mateusz Ishka. Another important expedition in this context is the Armenian-French expedition in Eribuni under the direction of Badalian and the Shams, mm -hmm. through which not only the long-lasting debate about the dating of the so-called Apadana structure, as you can see, it's now called the Great Columned Hall, could unequivocally be resolved, but the excavation also proved a continuous use of this site from the Urachian to Achaemenid periods, including several so-called post urachian levels. Although the latter chronological line has long been considered more a historical than an archaeological issue, both archaeological results, this means in Mezzamo and in Erebuni, needs to be implemented more consciously in current periodization of Iron Age, if not graphically, so at least in regard to their cultural significance by using a clear defined terminology. So what we are the main question we will try to answer in this lecture, of course, based now on the evidence of Aramus, are the following two. How to interpret the continuity of material culture in Armenia from the 11th to the 5th century BC, especially considering the revised view which for a long time assumed a violent conquest and subjugation of the Ararat plains by the Urarchans at the beginning of the eighth, and the intensive exploitation of the resources until the middle of the seventh century. And far more important, how are the effects and importance of the Urarchan domination of the Ararat plain to be assessed in view of the fact that even its collapse did not result in a general cultural decline with the subsequent abandonment of most sites, as was long assumed, and most of our colleagues still uh, write in articles, but is again characterized by continuity. The finding that former centers, and this I think it's the key question, of Russian foreign, or let's say so-called foreign rule, continued to be used and maintained until the Achaemenid period is particularly significant and has to be put in a historical context. So, of course, the answer of such questions uh, can only, let's say, hope to be successful at least, try to be successful, when we can also answer the main question, of course, what is Urartu? And even here, it's very, very difficult to find a common opinion about Urartu. So there are different sources, different approaches, traditions, and so on. In our opinion, a very important step in solving such problems was or is the proposal made 
by the editors of the symposium held in Munich in 2007, which clearly uh, demanded a clean terminological definition and separation of the source material used for the reconstruction of Russian history. This is first the distinction between written sources, this is cuneiform sources, and material cultural, so archaeological sources. And in this context, there is uh, more uh, differentiation between so-called endogenic Russian inscriptions and exogenic Assyrian sources. And this is expressed also in the title as Biainili Urartu. So we will follow this suggestion and put some more additions and refines and details. So when we are speaking about Biainili or Biaini, this is a matter of which uh, philologists should solve. These are intended the, the, the Urachian cuneiform sources, which important to note, do not, um, so of the, of the Urachian, whose kings do not refer to themselves as Urachian, but as kings of the land of Kur Shurawe and Kur Bienawe, two terms which themselves poses additional problems that has not yet been satisfactorily resolved. However, this group of sources mainly reflects the view of the royal dynasty of Tushpa, and as you can see, is a very limited time period in this bigger context. <coughs> me. The second term, Urartu, uh, as it is a, an Assyrian term for this region, is used to denote the Assyrian cuneiform sources. So this is the Assyrian view of this region and considers all political and cultural entities or, uh, accordingly from its first attestation of the 13th century. So also of those polities and entities before the period of Biainili. In, in this regard, <clears throat> we would suggest to extend its duration up to the time of the Reyos, based on the Neo-Babylonian use of the toponym Urartu as Urashtu, and the latter as synonym for Armenia in the Behistun inscription when referring to this region. In this, and by introducing maybe to be more, more clear, a new term, late Urartu. So Urartu would be the Assyrian view and late Urartu would be the post-Assyrian, let's say new Babylonian person view of this region. In this context, we would like to remind also of the description of Xerxes at Van, whose political message in our opinion is very clear. It shows, that Van was still considered a key site for the political legitimation, legitimation of royalty over Urartu or this region. So if one accepts this interpretation, the late Urartian period could even be extended to the first half of the fifth century. As we will see, this is exactly the time period which is attested in Aramus. And, excuse me, and the third one, Nairi, this is a, a new category introduced here in order primarily very preliminary form to underscore more clearly the importance of material culture for this topic. Since in our view, this was not sufficiently taken into account in the original definition, or let's say title by the editors of the proceedings. It takes up a term suggested by different scholars focusing on archaeological materials, most notably Uzfirat and or Guarducci. So it has to be stressed that this term is very highly problematic as it can easily be misleading in our opinion. But as every ch uh, child needs a name, let's start with this one. We can make then additions. So why is this misleading? We think that the biggest problem is that the suggested cultural continuity from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age, involuntarily maybe, associates also that the origin of the kingdom of Urartu can be traced back to the early late Bronze Age, or at least to the 13th century, based on the oldest Assyrian attestation of the term Urartu, which, as I said, it's to understand like 
Melikishvili only as a toponym, not as a political confederation. The same problematic implication also arises, in our opinion, from the designation of this period as Le Chachin Medzamor Horizon, which is uh, very common, not only in Armenia, but also in Western literature. As uh, also in this case, the subdivision in six successive stages here marked in red, again suggests that there is a cultural continuity. Uh, so this means a, a, a development, which is very often associated with the term etuni. So the, the idea that there is a very strong confederation called etuni developing from the late Bronze Age as a opponent of the Russian. As we will see, we don't share this opinion. As clearly evidenced now by the Aragas project of the Armenian American Aragas project in the Zakharovit plain, there is, however, a crucial break in the settlement history, not only in the Zaharovit plain, here it was well studied, but generally speaking, this is a period which is marked by interruption. And it's termed by Ruben Badalian and Pavel Avetisian as Leshechen Mezzamo stage three. And it is mainly characterized by the abandonment of most of the settlements, necropolis and fortresses on the plateaus which, and this is important, most vividly witnessed the transition from the Middle to the Late Bronze Ages. And after this Lesochen Mezzamo tree, so let's say in the Iron Age, we have a completely new pottery assemblage, which shows we have a, a clear break in material culture from the pottery view, but also from the settlement, so from the use of the landscape, which was used. And I think this is a important point which has to be stressed. So we have now to go a little far thematically, and I apologize, but I think this is uh, important to understand our approach when trying to define Ura, Tubiaini and Nairi. So we have to go back to the very early late Bronze Age by presenting this uh, schedule, which everybody uh, working in Armenia and in the Iron Age and bronze, late Bronze Age news, news. This is the schedule presented by Avitisian in, in, in several publications together. The, the idea was born in cooperation with Ruben Badalian and with Arsene Bobokian. I choose this one because this is the first PDF I found. So it's nothing, not only Abitician's work, but it's uh, generally speaking, the, the, the synthesis of the Armenian archeology, span which very uh, effectively and uh, very clear show the characteristic pottery of the early late bronze age called Le Sochen stage one and two. And mostly important for the transition from the Middle Bronze Age to the Late Bronze Age are those pots which are encircled with in red, which are uh, decorated with these very characteristic punctuated designs, which are typical of the Sevan Uzerlik pottery tradition, which is not only characteristic for the Armenian area, let's say in, in Le Shoshana, the most beautiful pieces, but also in George and Shida Kartli in the Berikl Devi Bureau number four, which is, I think, a very important site, which still is not uh, adequately published. But we see we have this tradition which covers the whole South Caucasus, this typical early late Bronze Age pottery, or let's say transitional pottery. Then we have the pottery with, with the marked here in green. I, I, I reduced now the, the schedule of uh, Avetisian, which are characterized by these uh, incised geometric designs and which finds also from the pottery shapes, in my opinion, good parallels with pottery described by Narimanishvili in the Trialeti region, which he uh, even defines as a own culture, the Sora culture of Bareti, which he poses in the transition of the late bronze to, uh, of the transition of the middle bronze to the late bronze age. So important it's here, the first case, we have different pottery traditions which crosses and stretches across the Lesser Caucasus. 
The blue circles finally show pottery, which will become characteristic for the succeeding so-called Le Chachin Zittel Gorebi culture, which now really dates to the 13th and 12th century. Most characteristic for this period became done uh, potteries of so-called Meligele types. These are these with these potteries with this very tall um, uh, in German hals. I don't know the English term, excuse me. And pottery, which is decorated with circles and wedge-shaped designs, as you can see here. The same pottery is also used by Abitician for define the most, so the characteristic pottery of the Le Chachin tree period. So this transition between what is more influenced by Middle Bronze Age pottery to the Iron Age pottery. Most recent studies from Georgia, so from Dolauri Cemetery and from Gracliani Gora, both located in Shirakatli, has shown that wedge-shaped pottery as well as Meligele pots persist as late as the 12th, if not even in the 11th century, thus pushing back to a transitional phase from the late bronze to early iron age to about 100, 150 years. This chronological reshape is finally confirmed also by the new excavations at Hovlegora, which based on radiocarbon dating, shows that the so-called San Tavro culture did indeed not begin before the 12th, maybe in the 11th century BC, thus confirming the date suggested already by Naramanishvili based on the evidence of Trialeti. However, a more detailed analysis of the stratigraphic evidence from Hovlegora, which we will now soon publish with Elena Rova, shows finally that the main period of the Santaro culture, this is the period marked by the burials containing the diagnostic leaf-shaped bronze dagger blades, so everybody knows about these specific uh, daggers, dates mainly to the 9th, 8th century. A interesting note, this is exactly the period of consolidation and expansion of the Orachian kingdom. So let us come to a first point. The early Iron Age pottery development from the 11th to the 8th century in Eastern Georgia and Armenia shows many similarities, both in terms of typology and in relation to their reminiscence to the preceding late Bronze Age, or let's say Le Chachin Zitl Gorebi material culture. However, more in terms of manufacturing and firing techniques than in terms of decorations and vessel typology, which um, consider, uh, which um, developed or changed radically, in our opinion. Differences between Eastern Georgia and Armenia can also be found, of course, and in particular this uh, refers to cups and max shapes, which uh, seems to reflect regional traditions, which are quite interesting, especially if you take the boot shape uh, drinking vessels, which are much more common in Russian context than in, in, in Georgia. However, in this case, um, we need future research. So now it's too early to, to make suggestion on these differences. However, this will be an interesting point of future research. More relevant for the topic of our lecture today is to find that the new pottery types of the early Iron Age stages four and five of the Le Chachem Mezzamor horizon are related, as said before, to new sites such as Mezzamo, Dvin, and Camio Bluo, which does not only show a relevant shift from the formerly remote hilltop fortresses, like on the Zahovit plain, to locations in or closer to the Ararat plain, but finally attest also first attempts of urban planning. A similar geographic relocation along the main river valley and planning of settlements can in our point of view, be noticed also in Georgia, like in the settlements of Hovlegora, Narikvavi, Treli, and Gracliani. So there is something happening at the advent of the 11th century. 
The first conclusion that has to be drawn at this point is that, as shown above, there is absolutely no such continuity in the material cultural development from the late Bronze Age to early Iron Age that would justify the subsumption to a common cultural designation, neither Nairi nor Le Chachin Mezzamore. It can clearly be discerned between an earlier and a later late Bronze Age horizon, which predates, this is now also important, the first attestation of Urartu in Assyrian sources. So there is no a priori connex between these two phenomena. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, the 12th century brought profound changes whose relation with the emergence of iron metallurgy in the South Caucasus are far from clear, but maybe they had their role and their importance. However, while they seem to have had less influence on the technique of pottery making and firing, typology and decorations changed. But for and most, the settlement system changed all the more radically, although the fortifications seems, and I stress seems, to have been generally retained. Why? Because in our view, there is currently less evidence for early late Bronze Age fortresses as often pretended. So also in this case, we are more critical than other colleagues. Nevertheless, pottery typology and decorations change significantly, excuse me, significantly more than is commonly expressed in chronological terminologies, which I think it's because of a traditional historic perspective. As emphasized at the beginning, this approach can hardly be defended any longer, neither in regard to the kingdom of Urartu, nor in regard to Etiuni, which as we will see, and I already said, stands at the basis of the notion of the so-called Le Chachin Mazema horizon. In this context, <clears throat> Uh, it is important to stress that the material culture in the region of Lake Van seems to have been completely alien to this development, which we saw at the moment. However, evidence from the late and early Bronze Ages of this region is still very scarce. Attempts to define this period have so far focused on a pinkish buff red burnish pottery as a possible precursor of Urachian red polish pottery. But this type of pottery, so the pinkish one, I think I, I, I refer, is not attested in the South Caucasus. In addition, the date of the context is still controversial. However, it seems unlikely to assign these burials um, to a date much earlier than the 10th century BC because of the uh, rich metal artifacts found in these graves. I will not enter in the debate of how to define a Nairi cultural zone based on groove pottery, as again, I think um, it's a historical approach to, to, to reconstruct polit political uh, entities based on pottery. And of course, we have not, I think, enough evidence for dating all this pottery, groove pottery assemblage in order to say they are all concurrent and somehow related beyond aesthetic uh, comparisons. So uh, other problem, the comparison of these potteries, so the pinkish one and the reddish one of the, of the Russian uh, sphere is moreover hampered by the situation that most of the Russian red polished pottery known today, so as it's published today, uh, was found in levels dating to the final days of the kingdom. This is to the middle of the seventh century. Ultimately, this circumstance even led some scholars like the editors of the aforementioned publication to ascribe its emergence not before the end, if not to the seventh century BC. So we have also here some chronological luck. But even if we accept a ninth century date, this type of pottery is only rarely found in Russian time context. 
As Szymanski rightly points out, this type of pottery clearly belongs to what he has called a state assemblage of an elite participating in the administ administration of the kingdom. An assemblage which taken as a whole ultimately presents itself as a strongly Assyrianized material culture, largely alien to South Caucasian traditions. As an interim result to the question of what Urartu is, we can state that while the notion of Urartu as a region inhabited by a multitude of tribes who shared common cultural values and were economically intertwined can be sustained on the basis of Assyrian cuneiform sources as well as archeological remains, the latter do not allow anyhow to reconstruct a cultural region Nairi which develops continuously from the early late Bronze Age onwards and is also not congruent with the later area of the Urartian kingdom. Its core area even seems to have been located entirely outside of these major cultural developments in the South Caucasus. So now it's <clears throat> time to, to be honest, what we think about this problem. I take just some water. It is therefore questionable from our point of view to understand the emergence of the kingdom of Urartu as the result of a prolonged process of consolidation that emerged in response to increasing pressure from Assyria from formerly short-lived confederations. Rather, we think the Urartian kingdom may just as well have sprung from the far-sighted political acumen of Sarduri or his son Ishpuini, who as leaders of one of these confederations knew how to take advantage of the fortunate situation created by the political destabilization of Assyria towards the end of Salmanassa's reign around 830, and which persisted, as we know, until the reign of Tiglat Pileser III about 745. This is exactly the period of the consolidation and political expansion of Urartu. With this approach, if we accept it, the impressively rapid expansion of the kingdom under Ishpuin and Minua from Lake Urmia in the east to the Euphrates Valley in central Anatolia in the west, which virtually occurred without considerably resistance or setbacks, can much easier be explained. It would thus have been primarily a diplomatic rather than a military masterstroke, in which most tribes probably joined voluntarily for their own benefit, in order to also have a share in the resources that had now become available again. An alliance, therefore, that was concluded under the protection and supremacy of Gotthaldi, as we know, according to precisely agreed rules, rights, and obligations for all members, including the kings. This view of state building would also explain why Urartu has always avoided direct confrontations with Assyria throughout its existence, despite it was destabilized. It was perhaps a question of fighting strength, maybe, but I think primarily a cost benefit issue that made such an undertaking too unattractive for the Alliance. In the end, as we will see, two of three trusts into the sphere of Assyrian interests remain, in fact, crowned only by brief successes. This is first in Hatti, where the Urartian attempted to enter into alliances against Assyria with the aim, of course, of gaining access also to the Syrian Mediterranean region, but which was finally stopped by Tigat Pileza in 1745, who brought order back to Assyria. Equally, in the land of Mana, excuse me, the Oratan kings get involved in a prolonged struggle, but finally they lost it to Sargon in 714. The third, towards Etuni, located north of the Aras River, the absence of an equally strong opponent created a different dynamic, in which, as we will see, the Urartian kings could finally celebrate among their greatest successes, 
by keeping eventually a prominent political role until their final decline in the middle of the seventh century. The relationship between Etune and Biaini was certainly one of the most intensive and is fortunately also one of the most comprehensively studied chapters in the archaeology of Urartu. Sites like Kamir Blur, Agishti Hinili and Eribuni has strongly shaped our understanding of Urartuan culture. Of course, together with Chaustepe, Altintepe, Topraka, Levan and Tayanis or Bastam, only to mention some of the most important sites. But in Amina, we have the chance to study in more detail the impact the spread of Biainili had on the local cultures. It is through this study that we can get a diversified and deep insight into the structure and organization of this kingdom, which goes well beyond the mere reception of their deeds described in cuneiform writings. The fortress of Aramus played early on a significant role in the historical reconstruction of Urartian advance into the Ararat plain. In fact, the prominent location in the midst of the extended basin of Aramus, located just 15 kilometers northeast of Yerevan, have attracted archaeological attention since the earliest investigations at the nearby site of Ela in the 30s, 1930s. Influenced by her parallel investigations at Ela and Mezzamo, Emma Kansatian suggested in the 70s that Aramus belonged to an Etunan bulwark of the early Iron Age that was built to prevent an Urachian crossing of the Ararat River. During systematic excavation led by Haika Vitisan in the 80s, two significant layers of settlement were uncovered. These were dated to the Urachian and late Urachian periods because of the occurrence of red burnished wares, which were respectively suggested to represent a imported variant of so-called Biaini ware and a local limitation of the latter. The survival gray-black uh, wares remis reminiscent of ceramic traditions of the local early Iron Age was interpreted as hind for the integration of local cultural elements in the otherwise newly founded Urachian fortress at Aramus, as is uh, attributed to Agishti because of the Ela inscription. This uh, finding situation led to the definition and of a final, the so-called sixth stage within the Le Chauchet Mezzamo horizon by Haika Vitician. The Armenian also archaeological excavation started in 2004, and in this picture you can see the several areas which have uh, investigated since then, uh, have revealed a multi-layered settlement sequence, much more complicated than just the two uh, described before, which uh, recently have been dated by radiocarbon from the 9th to the 4th century BC. This sequence has significantly contributed to our understanding of Iron Age material culture development, including in particular the process related to the formation and demise of Biainili in the Ararat plain. Therein, the absence of destruction horizons is most remarkable, considering that both the expansion of the kingdom <clears throat> into the Ararat plain in the first quarter of the eighth century, as well as its demise in the middle of the seventh century are commonly associated with profound destructions and or abandonments. This contradiction, in our opinion, is not necessarily a consequence of a BAs of written sources, but rather of sometimes a too generalizing archaeological periodization seeking to correlate destruction horizons with major political events. So in the final conclusions we are now attempting to, to reach, uh, we will discuss two key findings and trying to, to um, put arguments for this new side or view on Urachan expansion. This is a, uh, a spread which complementary to violence, uh, strongly relied on an integrative and redistributive economic policy. A policy based on the formation of a differentiated social stratification, which benefited from the establishment from the kingdom, with each group's profits being reflective of their respective status and participation. 
In the case of Armenia, these newly imposed agreements, BAINI, or effectively laws, accelerated the formation of political identities, which will result in the so-called First Armenian Kingdom, or finally in the satrapy, Armenian satrapy of Armenia in the Achaemenid Empire. So let's see first the context. Aramus et Uni. There are, of, as many of you know, a lot of uh, inscriptions, Raj inscriptions, but if we take a more detailed view to the content, there are finally only two inscriptions which explicitly mentioned Etiuni, which were found in situ. This is first the, in the older inscription of Zolakert, where we find that the um, Etiuni, generally speaking, Etiuni was put under tribute after the destruction of Lihuni, the royal city of Lihuni in the land Erikua, and uh, which followed or finished with the foundation of Minwa Hinili. The second important is the inscription of Ela, where we know of the conquest of Darani, maybe Aramus, in the, city, in the country of Uluani. What is even more important than this, uh, let's say, quite sure location, localization of Etiuni in the Armenian, uh, in the heart of the Armenian um, Ararat plain, is the context. That if we take the Ela inscription and put it in context with the Horhor annals or the uh, inscription of Agishti from the Sevan Lake, we can reconstruct a uh, short historical break of very early Urachian history in Armenia, which points to a reconstruction that it was Aramus, the, the, the base, the necessary base uh, for starting the great infrastructure projects, which led to the foundation of Eribuni. In fact, Aramus was conquered in the year before the work started in Eribuni. So it's quite an uh, important um, point in, the, in this takeover of the Ararat plain. The third one, which unfortunately is not in Fountain Situ, it was a stela of uh, Tanahat here in, in the region of Sisian. It's nevertheless quite important because of one sentence, unfortunately very fragmentary, but the current reconstruction, both of Salvini and of Christofferson in, in the electronic CTU, uh, think of a personal name of a king of Etione. And this would be the very first and only reference that there existed a person called king of Etione. There is one exception in the time of Saduri, uh, a, a person called Diusini, uh, uh, maybe I forgot, but in that case, he is called the king of Igani, the king of Etione, which we think might maybe point to an existence of a similar construction of a confederation like Urartu, which also here in this part of Armenia sought a myriad of different tribes which were uh, joining short-lived confederations for their own benefits. However, if we take this very scarce evidence, we see from the general terming of Etiuni as the tribes of Etiuni, which were calling, uh, were, were assisting the king of Yahuni, Yawehi, against Urartu, we find finally a king of Etiuni in the late seven, in the beginning of the seventh century. And what is even more important or, or puzzling, let's say like this, is the fact that in the one of the youngest inscription, in the so-called temple inscription of Ayanis, we still find the land Etiuni among the foreign lands. So it's still, despite the 150 years of occupation, Etiuni is still regarded as a foreign land which has to be uh, pacified or integrated in this structure. 
so which are now the two main basic results we are going to uh, discuss the first is from the northern fort in trench nba1 and we will move then to nba5 which uh, contrary to our own idea shows that the fortress of Aramus is not a new foundation of Agishti, but seems indeed, as Kansatian suggested, to be a Etunian, or let's say early Iron Age fortress. In this um, trench, deep trench, you see below the Orachian period of time, a older structure <coughs> from which were taken two radiocarbon samples. I just show here the first, but they are completely identical. And both came from horizons below the Urachan, let's say below the, the foundation of the older structures. So they belong to the foundation of this older uh, fortress, older structures. And as you can see, the time it's for sure before Menua and before Ishpuini. So we are in a period uh, when in Van, there was still no kingdom of, uh, of Urartu or kingdom of Biaini. This would also explain why the fortress line in the North Fort has not, uh, is not decorated, let's say, or it's not built with counter forces, but has uh, um, plain facades and is also not rectilinear, but follows the natural. Uh, movement of the slope, which are characteristics of pre biennially or let's say early Iron Age architecture. This would explain this characteristic. Also, the pottery, we have no red burnished pottery in the old levels. So, from the S005B, we have only the Slasher Shell Medzamo 5 pottery, the, the, the black one, no red pottery. Then we, we can see here this filling. And the new horizon, which follows the 005A, immediately departing from this level, we have the red burnished pottery of Urarchan uh, type, which shows that the fortress was taken over without, let's say, destruction. And only after it was taken over, the North Force was repaired and built anew, but following the old uh, layout. In the trench NB5, it's even more uh, clear the continuity in the stratigraphy, where we find one and the same wall, let's say room walls, used from the early Iron Age until the fourth century BC in different uh, sets and um, in different positions. So we have a early Iron Age fortress, which let's say changed the owner and was used during the period of the Urachian kingdom and even beyond without any traces of destruction or abandonment. The second place, it's now the so-called East Fort or area OB1, on which is based our chronological, um, uh, our chronology. In, in the, 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 the key find is the profile section, profile section, which were uh, opened below the green structure. So the stones you can see here on the up, uh, upper part, these are period two, the green one, and the layers here about these uh, wall structures, which are the red one, which you can see below, this is period three. And finally, all the period four and five, which currently it's, we sometimes put together, this is the, the, the period of the Urachian kingdom in black, which shows the original fortress, period five. So the Urachian fortress, which was adapted in period three and then readapted in period two. And from the stratigraphical uh, point of view and even from the architectural point of view, we have no break uh, of abandonment or destruction visible in the in the in the in the in the situation in the finding if we come now to the radar carbon dates this is also 
of course, you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes disappointing. This is the problem of the Hallstatt plateau. And again, of course, the lower two fall completely in this uh, flat calibration curve of the Hallstatt plateau and just show that, okay, level four and five dates to the Russian period. So we know it also because of the pottery. But immediately on the surface, from the level, the first uh, cultural layer, which is related to this new structure, to the green structure, level Roman 3D, we have taken two samples, which again show different calibrations, but uh, in, in, the, in the case of the number 10, there is uh, the, the, the fraction, leach fraction and humic fraction shows that this sample maybe is not so um, poor, it has some uh, disturbance, while the other one, which was taken a few centimeters beside from a chariot seat, shows that we have a date which falls after the kingdom of Urartu. Even if this is still a problemat uh, problematic uh, topic because it's just uh, a chariot seat, so it's, it's difficult to put the whole uh, suggestions on, only on a seat, it's of course. But if we follow the strate stratigraphy, we saw there is an intensive settlement. And in the level two, we have again a, a, a sample from a, a, a charcoal, which again repeats the same periods, let's say in the fifth, sixth century BC. So we maybe cannot fix precisely where ends Urartu and where is the late Urachan or post Urachan levels. But we see that there is a continuity of settlement which goes through the end without any interruption. And what is uh, most, most important in my opinion is the evidence that in this level Roman 3a, which is in the upper limit of this post Urachan period, we found only, and I want to stress it three times, only in these layers, in the East Fort, in the Central Fort, in the West Fort, everywhere we excavate and where we find this, this uh, step from the Ro uh, Roman tree to Roman two period, only in these cultural layers so far we found jacks with this very characteristic impressed handles. They are only found in these layers. Why is this so important? Because I think this, despite the problems of, of uh, dating with radiocarbon, the position in this upper part clearly shows this pottery is not related to the kingdom of Urato. It's later, it's sixth, maybe fifth century, it's open to debate, but it's later. And this is one of those jacks with also Pavel Avetisian, based on the work of um, Piotrowski, referred as one of the most characteristic vessel shapes of the latest or youngest Le Chachem Metzamor 6 horizon. This is also the pottery which was found in the destruction horizon of Kamia Blue, in the citadel and in the settlement. This would mean that Kamia Blue was not destroyed in the middle of the seventh century, but in the sixth or maybe in the fifth century. And this I think would be, is a, a interesting result. Let's go further to see that it's not just imagination, but we have further results which confirm this theory. We move now to the central fort, which uh, was investigated until 2000, before Corona, I, I, lo I lost the years, I will stop because of Corona. And we're also able to open a quite large area. And here also, again, two uh, findings uh, are especially important. The first is the profile section of this small gate, which shows again, continuity of use. Then the relation to this other gate here, where we find, um, Again, on this transition be between the red, this means period three and the blue period two, one, again, on this level, this pottery, only this pottery. And 
especially important on the same ground. So this is the gravel floor of this period 3A, where we found this pottery. In the phase after the, the reconstruction of this gate, you can see it here, the gate before in, in the period three was the, 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 jaw, the door jump was here and it was a little bit removed, so adapted. And this floor was again, just replastered. We found this characteristic pottery which is not Urachan, for sure is not Urachan. This is completely another, um, another paint. It's more like that, the, the red pottery we found also in Hovlegora, or which was found in uh, Azatan by, by Furtwenger and their colleagues, which I think it's Achaemenite in period. And finally, this pottery with this pale uh, pottery with the red um, color, which was found on the threshold of this door and it's the youngest phase, which clearly shows that we are here for sure, not in the seventh and not in the sixth century, but maybe in the fifth century. So again, we have this uh, evidence, this pottery seems really to be younger. Now I can, uh, as I discussed this topic some years ago in Viterbo and uh, Professor Calieri rightly uh, made a critic uh, calling me, how, how can you be sure that there is continuity in, in stratigraphy? And he was right, of course, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to pretend to, to see abandonment or, or, or continuity. And, and so I was looking for some uh, good findings, and I hope he is now listening <laughs> to this, to this uh, lecture, so I can finally give uh, an answer to him. Yes, now I'm sure we have continuity, and this is one of the most important results from the center fort. This is this room two, where we have this uh, room, which was entered here from the west or also from the, from the north, uh, which was surrounded by these um, uh, features containing uh, storage vessels. You can see here uh, the, the, the better preserved one. And Going further, you can pass to the next room here behind this storage room, where we found a kitchen for produ produce, uh, producing bread. And indeed, Roman Hofsepian could find here remains of wheat and other cereals in these pots. And what is here interesting is that the foundation or the original construction of room two falls in the period of the Urartu, so of the Urachan kingdom of Biaini in the eighth and seventh century, and continued to be used during phase three, so period three. And in this period, some of the pots were replaced by new ones, so different kinds. So we have here the more typical late Urachan pots. Others were then replaced by new one. Sometimes the old remained in situ, they were just put in the, in the old one. And in the period two, when we have in this part a freestanding columned structure, clearly of a caminate uh, taste, still four of these storage vessels were in use. These are these four here above. So we have here a room which was continually used from the seventh to the fifth century without interruption, without breaks, with one and the same pot used and reused. So I think this is now maybe a, a better answer to his question. So we will now go briefly, very briefly, because I thought time is going passing very fast, the importance and the aspect of cultural legacy. So if we take this idea that Urato or the king of Biainili is not a foreign uh, kingdom which suppressed people by conquering them, but was more a, a ideology, let's say, a, 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 a cooperation proposal to become part of this project first. And if we take the evidence that many sites, not only Aramus, but Eribuni, Mezzamo, and specifically also Kamir Blue continued, then we see that the most important legacy of the Russian presence in Armenia was to give this region some idea of statehood. So they gave the, they, they laid the basis 
for the development of great infrastructural projects where the local people were involved, actively involved for their own benefit and not just as slaves. And after the fall of uh, this dynasty, they just continued to use these structures. I would just like to finish the comment of the redating of Carmel Blue, as I think this is one of the most important aspects we are unfortunately still trying to solve beyond any doubt in our cooperation with Michael Badalian in Carmel Blue. But nevertheless, I would point uh, just briefly, if I am allowed, Elena, just briefly, the main point why we uh, are so sure <laughs> or pretend to redate the destruction to the fifth century. It is mainly because of one finding. Again, it's just a detail. But however, uh, Ivan Chik uh, discussed the, the, the so called Scythian or Chimerian findings found in Kamir Blue and making a, a very interesting collection and showing very clearly what was found in which context. And the most important thing, I think it's that two of these uh, so-called uh, rider men or horse um, features were found in the, in, the, in the storage rooms together with such uh, pieces and findings. So of course, to date this, or the, the destruction to the 6th or 8th century, 7th century would be um, difficult with this material, since all of this material can easily be dated to the 7th century. So this is not the point. But as Piotrowski said, it's of course nothing special to find material of the 7th century in the storage rooms of a fortress which was constructed in the 7th century. So we have to look for findings which were for sure uh, dating the final days, so the date of destruction. And this is one special um, piece, this um, horse divisor, stripe divisors, of, with this assemblage, with this silver falera, which was found with a um, skeleton of the horse in this area in the citadel of Carmel Blue. So not somewhere stored in, in, the, in, the, in, in the rooms, but here still on the horse in battle in the destruction layer of these houses, which all we know were so-called huts, where the people uh, so, uh, looked for their last defense before to, uh, be killed. And this is this very characteristic stripe separators which according to the typology of Mahotic, it's one of the youngest and less distributed in the South Caucasus. So, but it's still um, attested as one of the youngest uh, kind and especially important to the region of the Volga. And we find this kind of strip separators also on the silver rita of Eribuni dated to the fourth century or also in the representation of the um, Palace of Darius, where we found this kind of stripe separators. Moreover, we have also in, in a burial in Haftishevi, in Shidakartli, where again, we have this kind of, of um, separators. And finally, in the burials of the Volga region, which again points to a younger date, especially the Kurgan of Volkovsky, which dates to the 5th, 6th century. So finally, if we accept these pictures as an indicator of the 5th century or the 6th, 5th century, so we see this rough distribution map that we have indeed former Urachian centers, and especially here in the north, um, fortresses which continued despite they have been founded by Urartians. And we have even one piece here in Hovlegora, uh, for, unfortunately a, a chance find, which shows there are also relations crossing the, the, the South Caucasus. So in our opinion, uh, we have a lot of post-Urartian sites in Armenia. We have just to, to restart rethinking of the dating and their, of their contextualization. So thank you very much. This is all I have to say. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Walter, for this very dense presentation that uh, uh, I am sure brings uh, uh, a lot of uh, new uh, new material. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, the evidence is actually, um, is actually multiplying for continuity of, uh, in the Achaemenid period or, uh, or at least post-Uratian period of, uh, uh, of um, settlement and, uh, and uh, continuation also of some official uh, uh, activity. Uh, of course, most of what you presented is very, uh, very technical. So I'm not an expert on this period, Alessandra neither, but uh, I am sure that there are some uh, among the public some people who will have some uh, some questions about these uh, about these uh, details let's say before going to more general uh, more general discussion so i invite uh, um, I invite our our participants to ask some uh, to ask some questions i don't see any uh, I don't see any raised hands. I don't see also any question in the uh, in the uh, in the chat list. So, um, specialist of first millennium, please uh, uh, raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. So, Alessandra. Well, I, so no, I'm not specialist for Urartu at all. Um, and I already see that there is um, a question, but uh, um, just just uh, um, for you, if you could repeat at, at towards the end of your presentation, uh, you were so I got the general idea of your basic uh, argument that what we see in Armenia is a longer continuity, if I understand it correctly, beginning in the late Bronze Age and. Uh, stretching up to the 5th century BC, in which, let's say, the classical Urartu presence is just a, 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 an episode in the middle, so to say. And at a certain point, uh, you were um, commenting upon the legacy of uh, the Urartu kingdom in Armenia. And if you could repeat what you said, you said something like, um, the legacy was important because they imported an idea of state and uh, um, a particular governance uh, uh, model, which yes. was then uh, developed even when Urartu was not there anymore. Can you elaborate a little bit on this idea? I would like to understand. Yeah, you understand it correctly, but just one Correction. So I, I do not say that there is a continuity from the late Bronze Age until the Iron Age. Contrary, there is absolute no continuity. We have something is happening with the emergence of iron metallurgy, let's say in the 11th, 10th century. There is a completely new shape, completely new system. And in this system, I don't even know how to, to explain. However, there are tribes living in this region. And with Urartu, which maybe it's uh, more strongly influenced by Assyrian, they were developing this system of governance. Let's call it Urartu or Biaini, however. And it was not a system based on violence and war, but was a system based on, as Simanski has said, of some kind of uh, um, social cooperation between the tribes and more, uh, um, let's say, a cooperation. And the same, I think, happened in Armenia. So the approach of these armies, of course, there was violence and murder and rapes and what you want. But this was just one point. One, the, the most important point was that most of these tribes participated, joined these expeditions for their own benefits Got get in touch with with uh, these kings, with this ideology of this, let's say, these um, agreements based on um, on on uh, 
divine protection that everybody has the obligations, their rights, and so on. And by cooperating with this idea, they learned and were implemented in these structures. So why uh, constructing Agishtihinili, Kamir, Blue, Ereboni, and all sites which are Middle Iron Age. So this is not the Urachan who constructed them for their own benefits by slaving the population, but they were constructed together for the benefit of all of them, the locals and all others which were part of this of this um, project, like, 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 like say like this. Basically, why I'm thinking of this, because if we take the Russian centers as focus of um, violence, of uh, subjugation, uh, of, of um, unfreedom and slavery, why these sites continue to be used? It, for me, it makes no logic. These sites were continued to be used, they were maintained uh, as places for their own identities, and they were continued used without any interruptions in Kamia Blue, in Aramus, in Eribuni, and continued to be used by these, um, by these people. An aspect which maybe I should have uh, stressed a little bit more is also that some facilities of governance, like in the administration of pottery, we see that some kind of signs of pottery marks, so-called pottery marks, continued and developed in this period three, showing that even this, this way of, of uh, governance remained despite the former kingdom disappeared. So this is the, I hope I, I could explain a little bit. Yes, thank you, better. that was very useful. So I, I've seen that John Scarlock has uh, raised her hands. So, um, John? Um, okay, could we put down the PowerPoint for a minute so I can, you can see my shining face. Yes. <laughs> okay, and I can see yours. Uh, uh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, okay. Ba basically, I wanted to say bravo and to congratulate you on the work that you're doing. Um, but I'd like to expand it a little bit. Um, I think we need to lose this evil empire idea, which is what you were, were fighting. And you're, you're fighting it, and I've been fighting it for years. And we need to rethink this whole thing about what an empire is and what it stands for. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you're adding land to your land and people to your people. That's that's the project of empire. You don't want an empty space. You need somebody to, you know, farm the land and do all those good things and serve in your army, too. Um, so essentially, um, if the place surrenders on perfectly without a fight, you don't damage it. You just occupy it. And that's what you're seeing happening twice. Aramis must not have been a great fortress because they seem to have, have basically surrendered to whoever showed up at the door <laughs> said we want it. Here, here are the keys. Just don't kill us sort of a thing. But anyway, never mind. Okay, that, that was just narc. But, uh, but at any rate, the point is that a lot of places are surrendering um, and they're coming in to the system voluntarily. So that's the important point to make. But, but this is true essentially of the ancient Near Eastern, you might say, empire. The Achaemenids obviously have done the same thing. That if they if they give you resistance, okay, then you do minimal damage basically if you intend to hold it and then clean up afterwards. I mean, you might even have some some absent destruction levels, which are that they very thoroughly didn't do that much damage and they just cleaned everything up very carefully um, and went on. Um, if you're intending to hold it, it's only in areas that you're not intending to hold, and you've realized you can't hold and are begging your revenge or whatever, like Manea, that that you do this sort of horrid kinds of things that that we associate with what empires do, and this, that's just not the way ancient Near Eastern empires, and including the Achaemenids and everybody, um, have behaved. And so this is is just a very important point to make. So this is an extremely important lecture, and I hope everybody listened to it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. And of course, uh, I have to, 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 to follow more also these this theoretical discuss, discussions. And uh, unfortunately, I found only two days ago the works of, uh, of Bradley Parker, which I'm, I'm uh, very anxious to read more carefully. So uh, thank you very much, of course. Yeah, I've also written on, on this. I can send you some bibliography if you with, like. With great pleasure, with great pleasure. Good night. Um, your email is? 
Walter dot Kuntner. What is it? Uh... It's Walter dot Kuntner. You can see written. Walter dot Kuntner. Yeah. At. At U A B K. U A B K. Dot A C. A C. Dot A T. A T. Okay. Right thank you that. very much. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> so, I hope goodbye. we can also. Yeah, I, I have to leave now. So, so. Uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, by listening to both of you, I, I really enjoyed this idea that we are, you know, questioning our basic understanding, not so much of whether there was life outside the empires, but really in the empire and what it means to be an empire and not necessarily an evil entity, okay? But to that, I'd like to add my perspective from the mountains. Um, the site, Pavo Larsen and I are excavating on, uh, on Mount uh, Aragaz is very high up, uh, around 3,000 meters, and it's a sacred site with symbolic reliefs, with a long history of, you know, use, beginning in the 5th millennium BC and ending in the Middle Ages. And there is one single great disruption time when we can date iconoclasm, a violent attack, of this sacred place. And this takes place, uh, dated by radiocarbon dates, at in the, in the, around 800 BC. So evidently something is happening. I have, of, of course, no idea who was there, perhaps a crazy, uh, you know, road individual who decided to, it's evidently difficult to, have uh, may take any conclusions or any you know any takeaways from this observation, which is an episode, but it's interesting to us. Um, there was an attack on symbols, complicated. I don't go into details, and we don't know how they were interpreted and whatever. But there was a there is some indication of violent political discussion, let's say, uh, of conflict of some kind of debate going on. So um, I don't know any, uh, does it fit your theory or not? Or it, you know, who knows what is <laughs> happening in the mountains? Of course, uh, not, I, I'm not questioning that the world was peaceful. <laughs> there was of course violence and we, we knew of many of deportations and, and, and problems and so on. However, um, I think, Beside this violence, there was, in addition, also other strategies. And one thing which uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering that many years now, it's how they organized and planned the thousand, ten thousands of sheep and goats they get as tribute. Were they really taken to van? It's not imaginable. They had to remain where they are because there you have the resources to maintain them. So maybe this is not to appropriate the, 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 the animal, but to have the right to get this animal when you need it for your rights. And maybe this was one case where some uh, shepherds did not, um, let's say, broke the, the contract and were maybe then taken to Punished. I, I, I don't know. We can, we can, this is philosophy. Of course, there was violence, unfortunately, as every, as any time. But I think this was not the only way of governance based on Aramus, of course. I have again to, again to repeat. But thank you so much. I thank you. That there is Dan and Elena wanting to uh, say something. Yes. Yeah, so just a comment, I'm I mean, rather convinced about the continuity in the post Urartian period. And especially I'm convinced that the Achaemenid period is 
under um, under uh, considered let's say in many in many areas so we still have to to exactly date uh, sites uh, of the Achaemenid period uh, and they have been attributed to uh, earlier or later periods as well maybe a bit less convinced I'm about the continuity between the pre-Urartian pre and the Urartian period. In, in, in particular, I, mean, I, I don't quite understand um, uh, the, the, that you put this uh, big gap in the 11th so century BC, because from our, um, of course, we are working in Georgia, so outside of the of the area of the expansion of the uh, Urartian kingdom. But our impression is that the late bronze tra tradition co continues until the, let's say, 11th century, and then. Uh, it's not quite clear what happens, but the 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 Iron Age. So this is the late bronze, early iron, beginning of early iron, and then there is a, a significant change. Yes, around maybe 900, 800. So not not uh, uh, not connected in this case with the uh, with the Urartian invasion or whatever. But let's say the change. In, in my opinion, is later the change in pottery and in other other things. So I don't see a big gap in the 11th century, but uh, just uh... let's say you know in Hovlegora we are trying to focus on this problem, and the article you will get in the next few days is exactly on this topic also. And what we have, it's it's true. We have in 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 Hovle, it's not older than, let's say, final end of the ninth century. So this would fit to your, uh, your idea. But nevertheless, Hovle is not that big site and it is not that multi-layered site which has thought to be. It's uh, much smaller and so it's difficult to, to grasp, let's say, the beginning. But we have there some evidence, at least from the radiocarbon evidence, that they are also older level and this of course uh, unfortunately is uh, mixed we have pottery with wedge shaped design but we have the same pottery as in the ninth century so it's practically uh, uh, based on hovle it's impossible to say what it's 10 what it's ninth century it, it's impossible if we take narek vavi of course also here the dates are difficult because uh, what they dated to the 11th century maybe it's also ninth century it's difficult. Let's say it's difficult. So I'm waiting for, for your excavation in Aradetis and, and for the publication of this yeah. of sequence. We will see. I, it's difficult. I put it now in the, excuse me, I put it in the 11th century more from a traditional point of view. I must, must be honest. I looked after the, when finished the wet shade pottery and the Meligele, this is 12th, 11, and then we have some tavo? I don't know. Yeah, but exactly. So the until the Meligele, I would still see it's a, it's a different from the previous periods, but still yes. the in the still in the tradition of the late bronze, let's say, and it goes until the eleventh century at least, and then. Also in Aradetis, we have a sort of gap in the next dates we have are in the ninth, eighth, and then the pottery is really the Iron Age, Santavro pottery. So just to understand, you don't see the, the break in the late Bronze Age? No, I see a clear break between the late Bronze, which has a development, but which continues until the 11th century. Mm. in my opinion. And then uh, I don't know what happens in the 10th because we don't have dates. Uh, or, and then uh, uh, since the 9th, we see, uh, we see a, another tradition. So the, the yeah. Iron Age, uh, Santavro, uh, Santavro no. tradition, something like that. No, no, no I, I agree with you. I agree in this point. Yes. Thank you. There Thank you. Question, there's a question from Dan. Not, not really a question, more of a comment. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Walter. And I agree completely that the hegemonic repertoires rule 
are just as important as the military conquest, even if not more important. And I think the key element is the, the Urartian religion. The figure of Hal has such a prominence that we do not see in Assyria or any other uh, states around Urartu. And I think we have indications of this if we look at the Western territories, if we look at Kayalider and Altintepe, where we have Urartian temples, but we lack some of the most distinctive markers of Urartian presence. We don't have any inscriptions. And in Altintepe, we have the Luvian, Cune Luvian hieroglyphs to, uh, that correspond to the exact measures of Urartian uh, uh, volumes on, on pottery. So it's clearly a local culture that wants to emulate or wants to be seen as Urartian. It tries to present itself as, as part of the, the Urartian state, but there's no conquest, there's, there's no known Urartian presence apart from this side. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's, it's, it's a step in the right direction, I think. <laughs> I hope. More thank you very much. Thank you very to, much. To do and thank you. I, I fully agree with you that he, the re religion, and especially the, the Haldi cult, was very, very important. Unfortunately, we have not found Musasia. So <laughs> I hope one day, one day, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other question or comment? Well, just just to add, Walter, if, if religion was the glue, um, then of course we have um, a key to read uh, alliances, uh, a specific keys. For example, if we refer to an episodes of uh, iconoclasm, then if there was some sort of religious change of habits, then uh, you don't need to see social conflict. So you can just read it as a sort of, you know, um, conversion of all the, or, or refusal of past, uh, past habits if, so it's an interesting standpoint actually. Yeah, yeah. It would be, uh, this is more a question to you back because I, 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 I'm not, know many about it but do you know of sacral architecture let's say temple architecture which can be defined as such in an early iron age context or late bronze age context it's difficult of course they had religions they have the the, the sanctuaries at homes and so on but i it, I, I miss a architecture like the susi temple or the babylonian temple or the assyrian temple Maybe we are looking in the wrong direction. Maybe the men here were the sacral. I, I don't know. Well, there were, for instance, uh, so, some uh, sanctuaries. Uh, we had an interesting lecture a few weeks ago by Shorena Davitashvili about these uh, uh, sanctuaries, late bronze sanctuaries in, uh, in Eastern Georgia, in Kakheti. So they, 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 they don't look uh, at all like uh, what we think uh, about, uh, what we would define as temple in the Mesopotamian or uh, let's say near, uh, traditional Near Eastern sense, but they, are cert they, they were certainly uh, places where rituals and something connected with the religion took place. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. I'm 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 coming from the Near East, <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm used to see, <laughs> look for temples. So, I don't see any other questions, yeah. Elena. So no, it doesn't seem that there are any other questions. Maybe I can 
answer to Bernard Pouli, who asked to be put on the mailing list, and we, we will do it for the next, uh, for the next uh, uh, lectures. And uh, by the way, the next, uh, our next appointment will be next week, so on Tuesday, the, uh, uh, March 9th, and our next guest will be Sarit Paz, uh, the lecture will be about households and community in the Curaraxas village of Quatzkelebi, Georgia. So we will go back to the Curaraxas culture and the fourth, late fourth of the millennium BC. And uh, so we will advertise it uh, uh, with our, us <coughs> our usual channels, uh, so Jackson lists and other lists. And by the way, uh, say, mind the date so see you next week then and thank you very much for Walter again. For thank you Walter thank you for the invitation thank you Walter many greetings yeah. to Italy ciao a tutti ciao a tutti ciao a tutti ciao, a tutti. ciao. ciao. ciao.